Welcome to Electron Line. We're still on the hunt to find an explanation, a mathematical derivation for the principle of least action. So this is the third part now, and we're getting close. Remember, in the previous video, we had a path, this one right here, which represented the path of least action. And then we realized that we took a different path that would slightly differ. And so if we then calculate the action of our new path, our alternate path, we'd get something slightly larger. So we expressed that on the previous video as S plus delta S. This was the action calculated of the original path, the path presumed to be the path of least action. And this was the original term that we got if we deviated a slight amount from that original path. Now let's take this delta S right here and write it right here. Now, supposedly, if we are on the path of least action, this term would go to zero. And so what we need to do is figure out what will determine that term to be zero? What will make that term equal to zero? And the best way to figure that out is that we have to write this somehow in this format. We want an integral of some quantity times this function times dt. Now, what does this function here represent? This function represents the difference between the two paths from our initial point to our final point. We also know that that function, delta x, is equal to zero at the initial point and at the final point because the two, the two paths must come together at the start and at the finish. So somehow we need to take this and write it in this form. Now we need a few mathematical tricks to do that. The first trick we're going to use is this concept right here, where if we take the derivative of two functions that is equal to the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. We're all pretty familiar with that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take this term right here, write it in the front, and move the other term to the other side. So we get the ddt of the product of the two functions minus the delta times the derivative of the second function with respect to time. Now what happens when we take the integral of both sides? So we're going to take the integral of the left side and the integral of the right side. Now on the left side, we get the integral of the function times d delta dt times dt equals the integral of the derivative of the product of those two functions. Now essentially, when we take the integral of the derivative, that gets rid of the derivative and we simply get the product of the two functions minus the integral of the delta times df dt dt. Now, if you look at it, it actually means the following. This is the integral of u dv, which is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. It's actually an expression of the integration by parts. Now we need to take another look. We're going to take this part, the delta s, and write it over here. Now notice, 1 half m times 2, the 2's cancel out, end up with m dx dt times the d delta dt dt. I'm moving the dt over here and write as two separate integrals. And of course, I have this part right here. Now we need to take a close look. Take a look at this right here and take a look at this right here. They are identical if the function here is equal to m times dx dt. Okay, if I make that the same, then I can write this like this. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this portion of our delta s and write it like this. And there's a reason for doing that, because essentially we're trying to make it look like this. All right, what does that look like? So the first part right here, which is this right here, is now going to be written like this. So we take f times delta minus the integral of delta times df dt dt minus the second integral, which of course is this integral right there. So essentially we've taken this and replaced it by this. And of course we can do that because we showed it that they are equivalent. Now, the function again is equal to m dx dt. So if I replace f by m dx dt times delta, and of course, since this is part of that integral by parts, or the integration by parts, I need to evaluate it at the limits. But notice that means I'm going to evaluate my delta function at the limits. And I remember that the delta function at the limits had to be equal to zero. And so therefore, this portion here goes to zero. That means my delta s still has these two portions left, but this portion goes to zero. Whoa, I'm stepping on my lights right here. 
got to be careful. All right, so our delta S then becomes this integral and this integral. So they have minus this, minus this. Ooh, I got to be careful because this minus applies to both. All right, I'll move over a little bit more. Okay, so notice that this minus here and this minus here, well, I need to make this into a plus because the minus and the minus still has to be there, okay? And so that means that this must be a plus. There we go. Or they can be both minus, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so this integral becomes this. This integral becomes here. I join them together. And then I factor out a delta, the delta function and I factor out a dt. Now notice what I've done is if this right here looks exactly the same as this. I now have it in the form that I want. Why do I want it in that form? Why is that so important? Well, the reason why that's so important is for this integral to go to zero, and essentially, that's what we're claiming. If our alternate path essentially converges to the path of least action, that means that my delta function will go to zero. Or for any other function where delta function does not equal to go to zero, for delta s to go to zero, what is required? It is required that instead of delta x to go to zero, because that would put me on the path of least action, this has to go to zero, because otherwise my delta s cannot be zero. So for any delta function, delta of x, which is not equal to zero, so I'm on an alternate path, but for that to represent the path of least action, this term must go to zero, and then I'm guaranteed to be on the path of least action, which means if this must equal zero, then I can go ahead and say this must equal zero for all delta x functions. So for any alternate path, this portion of the integral must go to zero, therefore this must go to zero. And now in the next video, we'll make the connection between this and the Lagrangian, and actually why the path of least action really works. So that's the key. Mathematically, we took that delta s, the additional action calculated by diverging from the path of least action. Then here's that integral that represents the delta s. If I now can express it in this format, then I realize if delta x is not equal to zero, then what's inside the brackets must equal zero. And so by manipulating through a couple of mathematical tricks, I have this in this format, which means that this portion must equal zero for the path of least action. So now let's see what that actually means on the next video.